Like every other uninspired YouTuber out there, I took the M4 iPad Pro and tried to use it in my creator life as my one and only computer for two weeks to see if I could make the switch to using it as my full-time machine instead of my MacBook Pro. The results, however, surprised me. Let me tell you how. Hey there, friends. My name is Jason. On this channel, I talk about tech and creativity and uh, how you can use one to help you with the other and uh, the pitfalls therein. So if you're into that, you're in the right place. And of course, if you find value in any of this video, then the like button is down there for you to, uh, to tap. Hit that like button and stuff. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, let's talk about how I fared using the iPad as my one and only device. But be sure to stick around until later on in the video because I'm gonna be giving you a few tips beyond my experience on what I think might help you make the iPad more useful to you because it did help me. Anyway, there are three areas I wanna cover here. There is the hardware, of course, then software, and of course, overall experience is really kind of important as the software and the hardware go together. I'm gonna to talk about this from a hardware standpoint through the eyes of a creator, which I am, and maybe you are as well. Could the iPad Pro replace the tools that I use for writing, as well as video recording and editing and all kinds of different areas of music production? Uh, you really have to talk about the iPad Pros in like a combination. You've got the iPad itself, then you've got the pencil, then you've got the magic keyboard, and there's nothing to complain about when it comes to the hardware. Uh, Apple does this kind of stuff better than anyone else. The iPad Pro M4 is thinner than the pencil. The thinnest thing that Apple's ever made, I guess. The tandem OLED display is also a great new feature on this. I didn't think it was gonna be, I've had plenty of machines with OLED displays and I didn't think this was gonna be any big deal. However, this tandem OLED display takes two OLED displays and kind of lays them over one another and gets more brightness out of the OLED, which is one of the things that people have often complained about with OLED displays. They don't get super bright, but this tandem OLED display has been kind of a revelation on this larger iPad, especially when you compare it to one of the earlier iPads. You can see right here, I've got my M2 iPad Pro 11 inch, and just looking at the difference between the brightness of the screen is really something else. Does this matter in day-to-day -day use? No, probably not. I mean, honestly, but if it's time for you to upgrade iPads or you want to try using the iPad instead of using a regular old computer for your, your work life balance, it's definitely a plus. I also got the nano texture display. I always put a paper-like screen protector on my iPads, both to mitigate fingerprints and to give me a better handwriting surface. I like the nano texture a lot more than the glossy iPad because fingerprints on screens drive me crazy in kind of an OCD type way. I just, I can't stand fingerprints. It's not as bad on phones for some reason, but on most iPads, the fingerprints just get downright nasty and it just bothers me. The nano texture display does pick up fingerprints, but it's nowhere near as bad as the glossy screens. And honestly, actually, uh, the paper-like screen protectors um, do a better job of rejecting fingerprints than uh, anything else. One big plus, my iPad doesn't look like I was eating pizza while using it, but there are still fingerprints. Apple does give you this very nice uh, special cleaning cloth, which is made just particularly for the nano texture display. And it was kind of a nice touch to get the cleaning cloth in the box because it used to be you know, computers, everything else, you've got a cleaning cloth with your device and they don't do that quite as often. They got rid of the Apple stickers, but they give you a cleaning cloth, which is nice. I guess the nano texture display can be scratched kind of easily. So that's a good thing. If I had it to do over again, I know some people have said they don't like the nano texture. Maybe it messes up the colors or something. That's not been my experience for an extra hundred dollars. I'd still get the nano texture just because I, I feel like it makes the device touching the screen and everything just feel that little bit more premium and it does have those other benefits. So your mileage may vary. The Magic Keyboard is now basically a MacBook keyboard. As you can see here, it is aluminum. It has a track, it has a very nice trackpad. It has the haptic trackpad that the, the MacBook keyboards have had for quite some time. And the nice thing about it is basically they've turned this into kind of half a, a case and half a MacBook keyboard with some fancy magnets in it. 
And from an engineering standpoint, this thing is incredible. But the Magic Keyboard also has its downsides. If you use the Apple Pencil in any kind of regular way, I feel like if I was going to try and you know write something or draw something or do any kind of other stuff like that, you can use it as a stylus. That's not a problem. But if I wanted to do anything else, then I'd have to take it off of the keyboard to do it. And then you've just got a naked iPad and I'd want some kind of secondary case. So something that already costs $350, I'd rather be able to remove the keyboard when I need to. The pencil is a surprising improvement. I didn't, there's, there's a few things that are different about this. It does some different things, but the one thing that I think most people who have the most experience with is that it has this haptic squeezy thing. When you squeeze it, it feels like it does something it's but it's just a little haptic buzz and when you squeeze it you can set it up to do a lot of different things it can bring up a palette it can switch over to an eraser there are a lot of different options in the settings i am not a visual artist so i have mine set up to do erasing which is nice because on the apple pencil too you could you could double tap like this and i never could get the double tap to work right and i was always just like hitting the thing so I like the squeeze feature. When I mess up something, I can just squeeze and erase and then squeeze again. So it's great. It is beneficial in certain instances with video and music production. Working along a timeline and using the pencil is a little bit, you can do more things. It's a, it's a finer touch than your fat finger. Uh, so it does have that. And when it comes to writing, there's journaling and taking notes, which I'll talk more about later, but the pencil experience overall is really positive. Performance wise, what I've got here is, of course, the iPad Pro 13 inch M4 chip inside 16 gigabytes of RAM and two terabytes of storage. Some people are like, why would you need so much storage on a, 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 an iPad? Well, that's a good question. The answer is I can't get that much storage on a MacBook without spending over $3,000. So I've got this with two terabytes of storage in it. And if it's gonna be my one and only device and I can get two terabytes of storage, then I'm gonna get two terabytes of storage as long as it's not gonna cost me like my left leg. You can't go to the store and get a Mac off the shelf as far as I'm aware that has two terabytes of storage in it. So this is a plus, but if you factor in the pencil and the keyboard, the price starts to get pretty extravagant, pretty quickly. Will you ever use all the juice that is available in this M4 chip with the, all that RAM and all that storage? Maybe not, but that to me is kind of like a, a, a false comparison. I mean, you don't buy a computer based on the bare minimum things that you think you might be doing with it, unless of course the number one determining factor on how, what you're buying as a computer is price. And if you're looking at this iPad, you're not as worried about price as you might be for functionality. So having the headroom of being able to do as much as you could possibly want will benefit you down the line. But only if it can do everything that I need it to do to replace my MacBook Pro. And that's where software is going to make all the difference, really. Software is where the rubber meets the road with the iPad iPad OS is still, even though they've done a ton of work with it, it's still a fancied up iPhone OS, right? It, when, it was, when the iPad first came out, it was just like a bigger version of iOS. And that was cool because then you could like watch YouTube on a bigger screen and read books on a bigger screen. But while I was one of the people who thought that the iPad needed to get Mac OS to be a worthwhile tool for more than just entertainment consumption, I don't feel like that now. The apps available now make it possible to do most of the professional work that I would need or want to do beyond well-established graphic workflows that have worked on the iPad for quite some time now. There are three areas where it needs to work for me without too many compromises to have a shot at replacing my MacBook. Writing, recording music, and video production. Writing is, of course, the easiest one of these to take care of. There are a lot of good writing apps out there that offer a bunch of functionality that were iPad specific apps right from the get-go. From a note-taking and handwriting standpoint, the iPad has come a super long way. Notability, GoodNotes, those are both apps that I've had for years and I've used for a lot of different things, but I never fully stuck to either of them because 
they didn't have the three-way cross-platform iPhone, MacBook, iPad kind of functionality that I really needed in my note-taking app to adopt it full time. I like the writing experience in Notability probably best compared to all of the note-taking apps that I've used on the iPad. And GoodNotes is always improving, but I have to admit, it, I just didn't like the way it interfaced and I just never used it as much as I wanted to. One of the things I do on my iPad is handwriting journaling. I do something called morning pages where every morning I write for 10 minutes every day before I really get started doing anything else. And so writing on the iPad has taken over writing in composition notebooks for me. I have dozens of composition notebooks that I've filled over the years and it's just getting ridiculous. So I was glad to be able to stop buying composition notebooks and doing my journaling on the iPad. Writing and note taking has been a huge thing for me. I've always been somebody who carries around something that I can jot notes into. It used to be a little notebook and now it's my iPhone. And it always kept coming back to the thing that I had available to me on all my platforms, which was, of course, Apple Notes. I can make a full video on how I use Apple Notes to carry all the different writing ideas and all the different things that I need to jot down, how I use it to organize or sort of keep in one place all the stuff that I need for longer writing projects or if I need to get more organized in a different place with something that I've been working on. I use Scrivener. I've used Scrivener for something like 15 years now, first on the Mac and now on the iPad. When it comes to writing novels or longer projects, you need an app that helps you get organized and allows you to see your work in chunks. And Scrivener by far is the best that I've found out there. I wrote my first novel using Scrivener. Well, I, I got Scrivener when I was working on drafts of my first novel, and that helped me really get it organized and be able to move things around so Scrivener, great app. I like it better on the iPad, which is why I bought it for the iPad. I don't even have a license for it on the Mac anymore. Uh, so if you're a writer, do check out Scrivener. Music wasn't even really a consideration for me on the iPad. I know that there was GarageBand. I've tried GarageBand. It just, was, it's kind of like a toy to me. I've used Logic for 20 years at the, well, maybe even more at this point. Before it was owned by Apple, even, I used Logic. So when Apple came out with Logic Pro for iPad, it wasn't a huge problem for me to transition over and try to use that. I made a video last year where I wrote and recorded an entire song in one day using Logic for iPad. I'll link that up here so that you can go check that out. Logic Pro for iPad was fine. It was fun. It was a lot like regular uh, Logic. It had drummer. It had a lot of the features that come with Logic. It had some stuff that Logic didn't have. Uh, but it also felt kind of like GarageBand, too. I mean, I could see myself using it a lot, especially uh, it, it felt like it had a more organic workflow. When you're in the iPad, you're not being distracted. Like, whatever you have is full screen, and you're just using it. So Logic for iPad was great on that front. Now there's a limitation to the kinds of interfaces that you can use you have to use things that are class compliant. So anything that requires a driver, you can't use. Uh, you can't use Thunderbolt uh, interfaces. And I've had Thunderbolt interfaces mostly for a long, long time. So there are some things that hold you back from using the iPad and Logic for iPad if you've been doing this for a while. I, you know, I have thousands of dollars invested in plugins and virtual instruments and all other kinds of things that aren't available on the iPad and may never be. I mean, I've got universal audio plugins. I've got the native instruments complete everything package. I've got so much stuff that I can't get into the iPad. So from a practical standpoint, I could make Logic Pro for iPad my one and only thing to use. There are great virtual instruments within that. There are companies that are developing virtual instruments and plugins for iPad, but because I have so much invested, it would be a big loss for me in, in my career as a music person. If I were just starting out and I realized that a $2,500 iPad with all the fancy doodads that go along with it is probably not the iPad that somebody's going to get if they're just starting out. But if I were just starting out and getting into recording, then Logic Pro for iPad would be a great option to to get started. It kind of reminds me of back when I was a young person using four track machines 
and those kinds of things that were much more simple and straightforward. You can get into a little bit of option overload when you are working on a computer and trying to record things. You can always find like, oh, the way there's a different plugin. There's a different instrument. There's a different sound. I can do that again. I can blah, 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 blah. With the iPad, you're stuck in it and it has its limitations. There's something to be said for limitations when you're creating. When you have only a limited number of tools at your disposal, those limitations force you to make choices instead of buying another plugin or something else that you could just go to some website and get. Computers have made music production and creation much more difficult than it used to be, which is kind of ironic because they've also made it much easier to do for more people. But now that you have every choice in the world, it's very difficult to make any choices at all. And then you become kind of a buyer of software and hardware for music instead of a musician who makes music. And that's a trap that I've gotten stuck in. And I know a lot of other people get stuck in that you keep buying things and you feel like you're making progress, but actually you haven't recorded a single thing. You've just been buying things. Video editing is where the iPad really has a chance to shine. I have friends who edit all their videos on the iPad and have for quite some time. I, the, I've i used LumaFusion on the iPad before Final Cut for iPad was released, and it was fine. It was, again, a much more simplified editing process, which can be a good thing. I don't do anything fancy with my video edits, so I could use really any tool. And I had high hopes for Final Cut for iPad because I use Final Cut on my MacBook. But I feel like Whereas Logic for iPad is further ahead, maybe because they had GarageBand beforehand, Final Cut for iPad is lagging behind. It doesn't feel or work like Final Cut Pro on the MacBook. So using it, I found myself doing a lot more searching to figure out how to do simple things that are pretty self-explanatory in other computer-based video editors, things that I do all the time in Final Cut. I don't know if it's a product of the touch interface, but Final Cut for iPad feels kind of half-baked. Not to mention there are some features that just aren't there. You can't detach audio from a file. Uh, so if your audio gets out of sync with your video because you recorded the audio through USB and it got messed up and not synced with your video, you can't detach the audio and line it up, which is frustrating. There are ways to fix that, but those are extra steps that you wouldn't have to take in any other circumstance. So I don't know why that's not there. There's also no way to automatically sync video and audio if you've recorded audio separately and then want to bring it into your video. You have to line it up manually, which is the way that people used to do it all the time. And it's not that hard to do if you've done it before. But again, it's a basic function of most editing software and it's just not there. Overall experience, could I ditch my MacBook and sell it and go full iPad all the time? I mean, yes and no. I've had a lot of time and money invested in the old way. So that's one thing I'd have to really like relearn a lot of stuff. And if I was willing to take the plunge and not look back, I'd eventually be okay. And for people who haven't had decades of time and, and money invested in learning to use the traditional platforms that came before the iPad, this is just as viable a, a workflow as any other. Yes, some of the software leaves me wanting and that will work itself out in time, but the hardware is as good as, as any, better than most, but in the pantheon of Apple devices, the hardware is as good as Apple makes, period. In fact, you could make the argument that the iPad is kind of the showcase for what Apple is capable of doing in form and function right now. The only place the iPad really fell down for me was in trying to record video the way I've become accustomed to doing it. I like to use multiple cameras and to record straight into my computer using Ecamm Live, which is the best uh, recording slash live streaming software that I've found in the 10 years of doing this. So I have an affiliate link in the description if you wanna check out Ecamm Live. It is very, very good. Ecamm doesn't have an iPad app and the apps that are out there aren't really fully ready for prime time when it comes to that kind of workflow. That was the one thing I could use logic. I could make Final Cut work, but 
the friction that's introduced when trying to like, like right now I have my MacBook right here. I have my Elgato teleprompter right here. The camera's right behind. And that is just such an easy frictionless workflow for me that it would be incredibly difficult for me to transition away from that. And it would cause a ton of friction and friction is not something that you need when you're trying to actually run a business and get your work done. Friction is your enemy. However, there is a bonus. I promised you some bonus at the beginning of this, and I'm going to deliver on that bonus. Even though I can't do that kind of workflow with my regular mirrorless cameras and all that kind of stuff, when Apple released the new iPads, they also released Final Cut Camera, which allows you to use multiple Apple devices to record up to four cameras at a time straight into Final Cut for iPad. So Final Cut Camera works with Final Cut for iPad to recognize up to four different cameras. You can use the camera that's in your iPad or on the back of your iPad, or you can use your iPhone camera. You can use multiple iPhone cameras. You could use multiple iPads, any iOS device that has a camera. And I think it has to be iOS 17 or beyond. I'll put a link to all of the different requirements for it down in the description below, but it does have to be a more recent device in order to be able to do all that fancy stuff. And it's within the reach of anybody who has an iPad, you know, an iPad and an iPhone or can borrow a couple more iPhones or, or whatever. It opens up huge possibilities for people who haven't invested thousands of dollars in other gear and want to get started making multicam videos and really doing things that are pretty high level just with an iPad and a couple of iPhones, which is pretty darn impressive. Final Cut Camera working with Final Cut for iPad is one of those things that Apple does every once in a while where it's just, it really does seem like magic. They love to talk about magic and all that kind of stuff, but be, being able to do that is truly one of those Apple magic moments. In a way, it sucks that you're limited to Apple devices only, but I understand why if you wanted to try and use every single device in the world, it would be incredibly difficult to make it work. So they figured out a way to work within their ecosystem to give you the opportunity to do really intense video work. And then once you finish the recording, it all downloads into Final Cut for iPad. And so when you're done filming, you filmed everything on the devices that are doing the filming, but then they download everything onto the iPad and you can edit your multicam video right there on the iPad. I did this with a few music videos that I did for my other music channel, and I'll link to those as well. It worked really well and kind of surprisingly better than I thought it would. Now, am I going to go out and buy like a couple more iPhones to get a four camera iPad set up? Probably not. But if you start from there, if you start from an iPad and an iPhone, and then you work out. There's a lot that you can get done. And that's kind of the golden handcuffs of going iPad only. It's an incredibly powerful ecosystem. If you aren't already invested in another ecosystem, if you're just starting out and, or if you're willing to take on the ups and downs of changing how you do what you do for me, it would cause tons of friction to get away from how I've done things for a long time and move into the iPad workflow and I'm at a point in my career where I need to get things done more than I need to try and find new ways to do things. You might be in a different season of your creative career. Uh, limitations are there and limitations can spawn new kinds of inspiration. Sometimes it's what you need to take another step forward in your growth as a creator. Even though I don't think it's right for me right now. I am still incredibly tempted by the potential. iPad is closer now than it's ever been to being a viable option for somebody to use who has a high level of demand from their tech in order to get things done. And for somebody like me who does video, who does music, who does writing, all those kinds of things, it's a lot to ask from a, from a device and computers are made to have that flexibility, whereas the iPad hasn't always been that, but it's getting there. It's getting there really quick. Thanks for being here. Once again, my name is Jason, formerly known as Painfully Honest Tech, sometimes known as the JTL. Hit that subscribe button for more tech-centric creative life content and come on back and see me sometime. Until the next time, I'm out.